How's the royal family? I pray that everyone is doing well. Well, my royal family, this video going to be real juicy. Oh, yeah. I'm about to wear Trump's ass out. So I have this article I'm going to read to the royal family. And the title says here, Trump forced to speak to a near empty arena in Tulsa after supporters failed to shower. The tiny side so that the group size was tiny and outdoor stage closed early. <laughs> ouch. Ouch. Donald Trump's campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma didn't quite turn out the way he and his supporters had hyped. After bolstering close to a million RSVPS <laughs> in a building mass outdoor stage to, accom to accommodate overflow, very few people actually showed up for the event. Some news outlets estimate the count to be around 10,000, not close to even not close, excuse me, <laughs> not close to enough to fill up even the indoor arena. Trump and Vice President Mike Pence re uh, reportedly canceled their scheduled speeches to the overflow crowd after supporters failed to materialize. And outdoor stage had been set up to accommodate the thousands who would otherwise not be able to fit inside the 19,000 seat BOK Center where the president put on his first rally since March. The Trump campaign said they had a million requests for tickets. However, they were texting. There's, there's still space to support just minutes before the rally was supposed to take place. Outside of the arena, six blocks were blocked off by police for the expected crowd, but it was devoid of people. Both Trump and both Trump and Vice President Mike Pence speeches were canceled by the campaign. The Trump campaign blamed protesters for the lack of a crowd and ex and excuse excuses that that does not stand up to multiple counts and live fees that show the streets clear and empty right up until the rally start time. Sadly, protesters interfered with supporters, even blocked access to the metal detectors, which prevented people from entering the rally. Radical protesters coupled with a relentless onslaught from the media attended to frighten off um, president supporters. We are proud of the thousands who stuck it out. That is a bald-faced lie. Oh, I got footage by Royal Family. The Trump campaign communicator director said in a statement, he lying, lying, lying through his teeth. So let's get into this first video, my Royal Family. Let's see what's really going on. Okay, volume is nice and good. ABC News, Washington, and thanks for joining our coverage tonight of events in Tulsa, Oklahoma. President Trump is holding his first big political rally since March 2nd at that packed arena, the BOK Center, the Bank of Oklahoma Center in downtown Tulsa. Thousands of people there, uh, not keeping social distance in this time of pandemic, most of them, and it will test both the president's political strength and uh, the, how seriously people are taking the pandemic there in the Trump camp. President Trump has been eager to get on the road back to these rallies. These are the heart of the Trump movement. They are the fuel of the fire uh, of President Trump's campaign, and he's looking to jumpstart this campaign. Polls have shown him taking a dip against Joe Biden. And so he's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is also significant because this was originally uh, scheduled for yesterday, June 10th, June 19th. The, a celebration, the commemoration of the 
final word of the Emancipation Proclamation reaching the last enslaved people who had not heard it in Galveston, Texas, uh, and it was seen as something of an affront to that day, and so President Trump moved the event. Nevertheless, there have been protests, and the city of Tulsa has been described as on edge. I want to go out to the streets right now. Our Marcus Moore is there, and, and Marcus, you've been there now for a couple of days. This is a contentious uh, subject matter for a lot of people in Tulsa that the president has come to rally at this time in this place. What's it like there? Well, Terry, I don't have to tell you. I mean, you know, it's in a highly emotional uh, mood here for everybody. Uh, people who live here in Tulsa, the people who have traveled hundreds of miles to uh, attend this rally. And that's what we have seen here in the streets. And we're at one of the entrances to the BOK Center uh, where people lined up for days to be among the first to get in. And there are still people lined up, uh, but they haven't been allowed to go past this gate. Uh, the police have closed that off as this rally is set to get underway uh, shortly. But if I can, Terry, I want you to take a look at some video from earlier today and you'll get a sense of how many protesters showed up here and what the mood was like here in downtown Tulsa as police had a, a, a line set up, a buffer between the entrance to the arena and the scores of protesters who gathered here, many of them chanting Black Lives Matter and confronting a number of the Trump supporters who were trying to go through the crowd to get to the arena. Uh, only one protester we know of has been uh, arrested. That was a Black Lives Matter protester who uh, was near the arena. She was taken into custody and so far, Terry, things have remained calm, but the fear, not only among law enforcement, but some residents here in Tulsa, is that may not stay that way through the night. There was real concern, is real concern, as you report, Marcus. Thanks very much for that. Marcus Moore in Tulsa for us. Uh, he mentioned the, the people who have come from all over that part of the country, some of them waiting for days uh, through the thunderstorms, the summer thunderstorms that rake Oklahoma this, this time of year, willing uh, as so many Trump supporters have been over the years, uh, to wait in line to see the man that embodies their political hopes, their hopes for the country. Trumpism is a movement like few others we have seen. And I want to go to our Rachel Scott, who has reported on it really from the get-go. Rachel, you and I have been to these rallies. Uh, it's great to see you there. Uh, how, does, how is this one different? What do you expect tonight, Rachel? Well, I can tell you that not only is the president eager to get back on the campaign trail, his supporters are eager to see him back behind that podium addressing them. It's the president's first time back on the trail in more than 100 days. But hours before he landed right here in Tulsa, news broke that six members of his advance staff have tested positive for COVID-19. And tonight we are learning that two of those are Secret Service officers. Now, many of the president's supporters told me they do not plan to wear a mask inside of that arena. Terry, you know from being inside, there is little room for social distancing. The campaign did not have any plans to have any social distancing. But before these attendees went inside of that arena, they were doing so at their own risk. They had to sign a waiver agreeing not to sue the campaign if they did get sick. Temperature checks and hand sanitizer were on desk deck. Masks were passed out. But again, it was totally optional whether or not to wear them. The president himself said he does not plan to wear one. And another speed bump here tonight, the overflow crowd. The campaign was bracing for thousands of supporters to be out filling the streets uh, right in front of this arena. Well, tonight it is empty and the campaign uh, is confirming that the president will no longer address the overflow crowd as originally planned outside of this arena. Campaign staff have already started breaking it down, Terry. All right, I see that empty uh, place where they thought the over overflow crowd would be and the president was to speak there. That's not happening. Rachel, thank you for that rundown. You can hear from Rachel's report that the Trump campaign has taken precautions. Uh, they are advising people to wear a mask. They're handing out the masks, as Rachel said, and temperature checks and, and all that. But when you look at that arena, you don't see much in the way of social distancing there. Uh, you know, crowds and power are, are linked in history, and there is something about being, anybody who's been to a political rally with a lot of emotion in it, it generates something special. And President Trump, as I say, he has created this movement where these crowds are crucial to it. And I want to go to Matt Dowd, a ABC News a political consultant on that. And Matt, as a veteran of campaigns, that is something special about the Trump campaign. This rally at this time, what do you see that the president is in Tulsa, Oklahoma tonight 
in the middle of this pandemic, going for it. Well, you know, we're less than 150 days before Election Day, and this the president, ever since inauguration in 2017, has really never stopped campaigning. He's always sort of got, done these regularized rallies, though this is the longest period of time he's not had one. I find it really odd that they chose as their sort of kickoff fall effort to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma is a deep red state, one of the most reliably red states. I remember when I worked for George W. Bush in the re-election campaign, there is no way we would have ever gone to a state that we knew we were going to carry. He carried it by 36 points. The last Democrat to win Oklahoma was um, uh, LBJ, who won it in, in, when he won a landslide across this, the, this, the nation. It has been Republican since 1952. Usually what you want to do at this point in time with this much, only this much time left is go to a swing state like Ohio, like Wisconsin, like Michigan, like North Carolina, or go to a state that was Democratic and say you're going to turn it. And so I know their strategy, which they've enunciated, is a base motivation strategy more than persuasion strategy, which you usually have to do both in order to win an election like this. But usually what you do is you do base motivation in a swing state. So you go to Michigan and you go to Grand Rapids, which is normally reliably Republican, to try to turn people out. I think what this is more about, instead of about managing the campaign and managing the electoral map, it's much more about managing the president and managing where he is emotionally. He gets as much out of these rallies as the crowd does. He feeds off them. He does much better uh, in his own self personally when he's in front of a lot of adoring people screaming his name and saying four more years um, than most other politicians that I've watched have seemed to get. But it is an odd strategy for a lot of reasons, and I know you're going to talk about race and what happened in Tulsa, but it's an odd strategy just apart from that why you would go to a deep red state with only 150, less than 150 days left in the campaign when you need to carry swing states. You know, I, well, I want to pick up on that because we haven't mentioned that. There's something special about Tulsa in American history, something horrifying and special. The worst race massacre in American history occurred there in 1921. And really, only recently have, have a lot of Americans come to understand this. That is one of the reasons that this is such a sensitive nerve for at this moment when there, the uprising in streets and cities and towns across the country in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and, and the notion that it is finally time for the country to re recognize and affirm the simple moral fact that black lives matter, for the president be going here was seen as something that, that might be uh, touch off some controversy at the very least, if not conflict. But then it's in the middle of the pandemic, and let's go uh, to Dr. Simone Wild. She's an ABC News uh, medical consultant and infectious disease doctor. Uh, you know, Dr. Wild, I just, if you have taken a look at these pictures at all, I'll tell you what they are. I mean, it's basically a Trump rally. Uh, and as an infectious disease doctor, look, as I say, they have tried to take precautions, encourage people to wear masks, uh, take in temperature checks. From a medical standpoint, is this a good thing, what you're looking at? What do you think, Dr. Watts? Is this, is this the way? Uh, what do you make of holding this kind of a rally at this point uh, in America's experience with the coronavirus pandemic? <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess she can't. I guess she can't. It is hear. hilarious. Well, me, actually, I want to go to Marcus. <laughs> Marcus Moore on the streets of Tulsa. Marcus, I, I just did oh my mention goodness. that Tulsa race massacre. This is something that, although I read a lot of history books and got taught a lot of history in school, I never learned about until I was well into my twenties. Here it is. How much are you hearing about that? About the 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 history of Tulsa at this particular contemporary moment when Black Lives Matter is a, a, a demand going up around the country. Well, well, Terry, when you go to the Greenwood neighborhood, uh, formerly known as Black Wall Street, uh, you hear a lot uh, about that uh, that massacre. I can tell you, I grew up in, in Texas, in neighboring Texas. Um, I don't ever remember uh, hearing about that uh, in school, much less uh, Juneteenth. That was something I remember learning about after uh, I was in school. So um, certainly, if you were outside of, of this region, for the most part, uh, you may know very little uh, about this massacre, but that has changed obviously and when we went to the Greenwood uh, district today of, of of Tulsa which is less than a mile from where we're standing right now you really feel 
uh, the emotions there. Uh, uh, one young lady told me that it is sacred ground and uh, they still uh, uh, feel like that moment in our history um, has not gotten the, the, the attention and the respect uh, it deserves. And it's one of the reasons, Terry, that when we were there today, uh, residents actually covered the monuments that, that commemorate that 1921 massacre. They covered them with tarps. And they also covered a mural on a nearby bridge that says Black Wall Street. They covered that uh, because they heard that Vice President Pence might be touring the area and they didn't want him or anyone from the Trump administration uh, to see it uh, because that's, they felt like it would be a photo op. That's how that's, emotional it, it is. That is very interesting, Marcus. The history, 1921, alive today. But here's the President of the United States now entering the BOK Arena in Tulsa, Oklahoma. More talk talk All from right. President Trump about the Black Lives Matter protests and uh, that zone in. Let's shut that Just down, my royal family. Let me, let me shut that down. Rally of this Let me shut it all the way down. And in this time of pandemic, he really hasn't talked about. So I purposely, my royal family, wanted to show that because you know they had to remain professional, but they were mocking him in their own way. They were mocking Trump in his own way. And um, it was quite scarce there. I know many have seen it and some haven't seen it because some folks is turned off with watching TV. So as we continue on my royal family before I really rip Trump's ass, let's go on to um, this next video. Let's take it a step further. <laughs> The campaign has said that President Trump and Vice President Pence both will not speak outdoors as they had originally planned. Both had planned to give remarks. The vice presidents were supposed to be about 20 minutes, 30 minutes ago. Uh, the vice president instead went straight into the indoor part of the arena. The president will not come outside as he originally planned. And that's because, as you can see, there is almost no one here. The outdoor part of this event uh, has been completely emptied out. There were perhaps a few dozen people earlier in the afternoon when they had um, some surrogates speaking on the stage. Those folks are all gone now. Uh, and it seems that the uh, estimates that the campaign had originally put forward, they thought they could see uh, up to 40,000 people in this outdoor portion of the rally. It hasn't even nearly come to pass. And so the question now is what's going to happen inside? Uh, inside, that rally area is still filling up. We can still see people uh, actually streaming past us, walking toward the BOK Center. Presumptively, those people are going to try to get inside the rally where there is still room for them to go. Uh, but it seems that, that the expectations for extraordinarily high turnout that the campaign had been, had been uh, touting for days now are really far below expectations. They'd said about a million people had RSVP'd. Of course, RSVPs are not actual tickets. They are also not, uh, you know, people in seats. And it seems that more people than they anticipated perhaps are in fact concerned about being in such a large, crowded environment during the midst of this pandemic, Anna. And, uh, and for good reason, as we've been reporting, even six members of Trump's campaign staff working on tonight's rally have tested positive for coronavirus. What more have you learned on that front, Abby? Yeah, this is something that uh, we learned just today, and it's not clear when exactly those staffers tested positive. But these are people who would have been here in Tulsa in the days leading up to this event, trying to uh, set up and arrange the logistics around an event like this. Uh, and six of them have now tested positive for the coronavirus. The campaign says they will not be attending the event and that anybody who has had contact with them will not be attending the event. But it has really uh, put a cloud over this entire event. Lots of the questions now about how effectively they've been able to contact trace these individuals to make sure they know who they've been in contact with. Uh, and then beyond that, what do we not know about who in this crowd who's attending this event, the, the thousands and thousands of people who are here who might also be positive before the coronavirus and may not even know it. Uh, we, uh, as we were coming in, experienced the same kind of um, screening that regular attendees would have experienced. Uh, they took our temperatures as we walked in. There were people offering masks, offering hand sanitizer, but I will note, Anna, the offer of a mask was also optional, in addition to the fact that it is optional to wear a mask indoors in that arena. 
Okay, Abby Sullivan, and we just got some news into CNN that the Trump campaign just sent out a text saying, quote, let me read this to you, the Great American Comeback Celebrations almost here, doors are open at the BOK Center, President Trump can't wait, there's still space, so they are encouraging people to come on down. <laughs> shit is funny to me oh boy let's get back to reality so i got one more video of my royal family but before we get there <laughs> they literally they literally my royal family was literally begging people to come and um you know, Fox, they made sure, and some of the other media outlets made sure they kept them tight ass shots because they did not want to show how empty the place truly was. I mean, even, well, you know, they stage hands. They was like, shit, we can wrap this shit up real quick. While he in there lying, we'll just, you know, start putting shit away. <laughs> But what I was thinking about my royal family was that um, we are in the retrograde phase and we are in the heart of retrograde. And it's, you know, it's not a good time to put on big events and it's not a good time to do long distance traveling because you're working against the universe. And Trump has made a complete fool out of himself and they going to mock his ass. Oh, yeah, they doing it as I speak. So, you know, Trump, you know, he butt ass hurt. I wonder, did Pence leave? They thought they were so sure of themselves that they was going to go outside and talk to the overflow and all of that. And that shit was empty. As we continue on my royal family. <laughs> Let's get a little bit more. This little taste. Dana. It's really not been the day that Trump hoped for. So, sources have told us that Trump spent most of the day upset with tonight's event being overshadowed by news that six of his campaign staffers working on this rally tested positive for coronavirus. You spoke to sources that said that he was kind of upset over the issue with Attorney General William Barr firing the uh, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Hard to call this a transition to greatness. <laughs> Right, and also just on that note, I mean, if you just kind of go back in time to earlier today before the rally, which he was still hoping at the time, uh, you know, this morning and into the early afternoon would be uh, the arena full uh, outside overflow uh, situation that they had predicted inside the campaign. But even before that, we were in a situation that until the pandemic, we, and especially someone like you, Boris, who covers the White House every day, has seen so many times, which is the president was embroiled in a crisis of his own making. And that is the really shocking, and we can't let this go, really shocking move uh, that the administration made, that the attorney general slash president made to fire the attorney general, uh, excuse me, to fire the U.S. attorney who is in one of the most prominent districts, the Southern District of New York, but most importantly has been investigating uh, the president's allies and has been in the, you know, been at, in, had a lot of tension with the administration and the president in particular because of that. It is his prerogative and that is why I'm told that he was saying to, to uh, allies uh, that he didn't understand why he was getting such bad press for it, but just because it is his prerogative, it doesn't make it right it doesn't make it palatable it just feeds into the notion that he just does what he wants even and, and especially when it can be perceived as just blatantly corrupt yeah and she's absolutely right about that with him always doing what he want you know he has tons of people that are legal experts that are there to advise him but trump is in his own reality and you know he's a he's a person that has illusions of grandeur you know like you see overseas you'll see um some of these folks 
um, they'll have all their military out, like over in Korea. Remember when he wanted to do that stuff uh, last uh, 4th of July, and he wants to have everything big. We remember during um, the inauguration, it was folks barely turning out. And see, Trump, look how, look how our father has, is, is really working on Trump, like he worked on Pharaoh. Trump is still in a state of denial about coronavirus, like a lot of people. Well, let's say some people. I ain't going to say a lot of people because just seeing that turnout lets you know that his base, he has lost his base because this is what I've been saying for the longest since coronavirus has came out. When people are dying and say you had a lot of faith in that person and that's the person who is in charge of that department dealing like what Trump is dealing with and you ain't dealing with it effectively, people feel in some kind of way. There's people out here don't have no jobs, broke, don't know when they're going to put the next meal on the table, worried about putting, um, keeping a roof over their head. And then on top of all of that, you got to worry about coronavirus. That is the equalizer that is out here and stuff. And so there are some people out here that do have sense and say, I don't give a damn what the president say. I'm not going to risk myself and my family. In fact, when I was watching some of the rally before the rally started, actually, I seen people, some pe handful of people coming there with ma um, mask on. I seen them. I seen them. But this is what Trump is going to get throughout his campaign. This is what he's going to get. And um, this guy has a big ego and you know, I'm going to say, you know, remember, remember like when those people got killed down there in Texas, down there at that Walmart and stuff. Um, remember when Trump went to the hospital and he was butt hurt because he wanted to see a big crowd. I mean, dude don't never know when to shut this shit off. So our father is dealing with him in such a way where it's very slow and methodical. It's very painful what he has to deal with. You know, because I know some people want to see him drop real quick. Think about something that I had told y'all um, a while back. I was listening to Big Judah and Big Judah said, no, our father is not going to take them leaders out quite yet like that. Um, he going to do them like he did Pharaoh. Um, he want to watch. He going to allow them to watch their kingdom fall before their eyes they're gonna see we're gonna see them um lose favor and grace with their own people because coronavirus is that very thing that will shut down many voices so trump is being mocked trump is butthurt and the only thing his weak ass know to do is blame others he is not going to take responsibility for anything, you know. Um, now America is on this um, guilt trip about Black Lives Matter for real after Mr. Floyd was murdered before our eyes. And there's just a lot going on with the universe. And continue to look at this with your spiritual eyes. You can see the divine hand all up in it, all up in it. And we are becoming the head, you know, and um, this stuff is moving rapidly. You know, the last thing I want to say is I remember somebody said, made a comment. They said, why are you getting so excited about um, coming up out of our captivity and stuff? And I said, I know things don't happen overnight, <clears throat> but I have faith. And we are out of our captivity. And look what's going on in America. It ain't a good look. And um, Trump know it, but he's still going to continue to stay delusional. So I'll leave it there. My royal family, 
Render your voice with your beautiful divine words. And as always, my royal family, I thank you for your love. And I thank you for your support. <laughs> and with that said, I shake.